Welcome. My name is Peg Maddox, and I'm the Director of Learning and Assessment Solutions here at Cisco. I'm excited to welcome you to this broadcast. I hope you will also visit our community website for education leaders, getideas.org, to check out the other broadcasts in our series that are listed on this slide. We will have time for a short question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. So as we go through the presentation, if you want to ask a question, look at the small icon of the hand in the lower right hand part of the screen and type in your question, and then we'll answer them at the end. Today we'll be looking at some new ways of thinking about pedagogy that can better meet the needs of 21st century learners. I'm going to be sharing with you a project-based learning pedagogical model that is part of our Education 3.0 vision. Education 3.0 is a term that we and our education partners use to describe the next generation of educational thinking. It's an in-depth vision of global education transformation designed to empower learners to thrive in the 21st century. So today's broadcast will be in three parts. First, I'll present our pedagogical model. And then we will have four, four guests, three students, fifth grade students, and their teacher who will be joining us for a discussion about project-based learning in their own school. And finally, after the discussion, we'll have time for your questions. So I'd like to start with this quote from an innovative thinker, John C. Lee Brown, formerly of Xerox Park, and now an independent co-chairman of the Deloitte Center for Edge Innovation. As he points out here, the world is changing. For the first time, students are more knowledgeable and skilled than adults in certain areas. And we need to consider how these changes impact how they learn and how they want to learn. We also need to be mindful that students have certain capabilities and skills that need to be allowed to flourish in schools, as well as their personal lives. Another author, Canadian author and professor Don Tapscott, became popular with his book 10 years ago, Growing Up Digital, The Rise of the Net Generation which discussed the impact of the first generation to come of age in the digital world. Now he's followed up with a study of 10,000 young people, $4.5 million study of students between the ages of 10 and 30. And his study noted several fundamental differences in this generation, including changed thinking processes. But most importantly, he found that technology is like oxygen for this generation. They view it as necessary for living. So here's some things he found in his study. First of all, students need freedom. They need freedom to make choices. As you know, they make choices throughout their day, and sometimes in school they don't make many choices at all. Um, they, they expect a large degree of freedom. Oops. Um, so choice is an energizer for them, and they leverage technology to navigate their choices, information products, video games, whatever they need. Um, this generation is constantly communicating and collaborating. As we know, um, they collaborate all day long in school, even when they're not supposed to, uh, by texting each other. It's something that they need to do, and we need to build that into schools. Um, they prefer instant messaging to email, for example, because it's faster. Uh, they cre create a variety of uh, relationships in this influence network that uh, Tapscott calls it. Ninety percent say they purchase products when recommended by their personal network. So there's a whole field of marketing that is addressing that particular net generation now um, that's very, very successful. Um, they value innovation. They're always looking for new ideas. Now think about the contrast between these needs and what they have to do in school. Um, so they're looking for innovation. And they love to look for innovations on the marketplace. For example, Nike and Apple's um, iPod Sport, where you can check your running uh, capabilities um, by connecting your shoe to your iPod. Um, they like to be entertained in work and education and social life. Things need to be fun. It's interesting to note that 82% of kids aged 2 to 17 in Tapscott study kids all over the world in various socioeconomic levels have regular access to video games, our fastest growing industry, even in this uh, downturn. Speed is important for them. That's why they consider emails to be snail mail, like we used to call regular mail, because they like instant responses. What's interesting, an anomaly, is that um, they put a lot of pressure on themselves when they're expected to respond quickly um, to instant messages and they want to think about what they've said. Um, next is uh, in integrity and um, openness. They expect to value honesty. They can detect when other people are not being truthful. Um, and they're very good at um, detecting uh, 
uh, when people are not being transparent. And it's interesting because they're markedly tolerant and fair. Again, their diversity of their collaborations on the Internet. Um, they like the ability to customize, as we've seen in, net, in Facebook and MySpace. These people are more um, often producing on the Internet versus just consuming it. Um, and they use social networking to create real and imaginary identities. A lot of these people have multiple Facebook pages, some with their real name, some without. Uh, finally, they're able to scrutinize. Um, they're really uh, they're, uh, seeing so much information that they really are able to find um, out whether information is valid or not, both through their networks and through their own research. So, for example, Wikipedia, I know a lot of teachers and, and uh, administrators are worried about them using Wikipedia, but students know what, uh, is, what is valid and what is not, and they use multiple sources for their research. So in addition to the changing expectations of students, another major consideration when you think about pedagogy for the 21st century is the changing expectations of employers. Now this slide from the National Council on Economic Education Workforce Readiness Project shows what employers are looking for from the graduates of two years, two year and technical colleges and the results for high school and four year college programs um, are similar. As you can see, employers are looking for new skills similar to what the students are looking for, creativity, collaboration, problem solving, etc. And this is what the students um, uh, exhibited in the Tapscott study. So there's many reasons to think about why we need to change pedagogy for students and teachers. Finally, another reason is the needs of society at large. This is a quote from Phil Schlechte's new book, Leading for Learning, where um, it explains that citizens need to be educated to, need, to the needs of today's society and today's community. It's a cultural requirement that students are educated throughout this country so that they can be citizens and educated in the world and the work of the uh, citizens of the country so that they can um, run the country, elect the governments, run the businesses that we need to have the democracy that we have today. So in the United States, the world of education is under great pressure to change fast. Many factors are driving this pressure, as we've seen, and these include the different ways learners want to access the system, the quantity of learners seeking access, the demands of learners for new skills, relevant skills, and they want to, the students want to participate in the communities and the new economy in a meaningful way, many feeling that they don't necessarily get that um, support in a lot of the work they do in school. At the same time, employers are demanding new skills uh, for survival, for opportunity, for retooling, for retrenching. Employers need people with new skills that allow for more nimble and responsive workforces that can understand their industry, but can also collaborate, communicate, and quickly conceptualize new approaches. And finally, society needs citizens who are skilled at making wise decisions, of course, as I said before, that impact our democracy and build a better world for all. And we need lifelong learners because we are going to have an ever-changing society. Wherever we look, we find education caught between the 20th century traditions and the need for a bold new design. So as we move toward looking at schools as learning organizations, this is Schlechte's uh, conceptualization of schools, we see that students are knowledge workers, volunteers at school, and customers of schools. Not factory workers, not products. Knowledge workers, volunteers, and customers. What are the implications of this statement for pedagogy? So here we can take a look at some of the characteristics of knowledge worker pedagogy, learning and teaching, as identified by some of the leading researchers in the field. I'll go through these fairly quickly, um, but you'll probably recognize some of them. This is um, our Education 3.0 uh, knowledge worker uh, conceptualization. First, personalized learning, which means that a variety of approaches are used to address the variety of learning styles. It means that students can choose their work based on their interests. It also means that the pace is varied based on the ability for different uh, students to work faster or slower or more in depth. And finally, students get to express their learning in products um, in their various expression styles, it's essays, poetry, music, video. They have a choice in the kind of product that they produce. Next, challenging learning means that we set high expectations, but they're realistic. Um, and then we continuously check through assessment, student and peer feedback and coaching um, so that students are constantly being challenged. Interdisciplinary learning is critical, and it's very challenging for curriculum developers, but it means we integrate curriculums, uh, content across curriculums so that we can make the mean, meaningful learning reflect the way we really do our work in um, the real world. A 
Authentic and relevant learning is very important. It means that students work in a context-relevant environment, not just doing worksheets, but creating products and doing activities that reflect real-world real work. And I'm going to show you a model for that later. Uh, it's not just what's relevant to teachers, parents, and community, but also what's relevant to the students. Engaging and collaborative learning means that students are physically, emotionally, and socially engaged while learning. And it means that we have to change the way we do things so that the students feel some sense of ownership and a commitment to get work done, not just for the teachers, but for their own intrinsic value. And finally, product-focused learning is really critical. It's a different way of thinking. A product is not a worksheet. A product is an actual uh, high-quality reflection of the student's um, learning and skills um, in a particular area of study. Now, a powerful strategy for combining these characteristics is what we're calling um, uh, P3 project-based learning. Project-based learning has been talked about a lot, and I'm going to describe a model of our own um, that we believe really is working and powerful. And we'll talk later with this teacher and students about this work. But we want to think about the, P th the three Ps as projects, process, and product. So the process of doing a project is just as important as the product. Um, and sometimes the product itself becomes more important because it's the motivator for the students to move along along um, in the project. Um, Project-based learning supports um, a learning a variety of skills. Uh, it supports personalized learning, uh, student interests. They can acquire a depth and breadth of skills and knowledge during the projects. And so it's not a special project that occurs a certain time of the year. It really should be integrated up as a process of learning throughout the year. Um, as I said, it, it will help the students uh, develop a variety of these 21st century skills that are integrated with the core content, um, not just as a separate lesson. And then finally, the product is critical because uh, from the student's perspective, there's a main reason for doing the process, not just to please the teacher or the parents or get a grade, but actually to produce something that they can be proud of. And the product needs to be published and presented to an audience um, who will approve it and give feedback. So throughout the project or the process of work, knowledge work in schools, students have a meaningful goal in mind and they're motivated, self-motivated to achieve that final result. The more that projects are being done in schools or this kind of process is being used, the more powerful it becomes for students to become more involved in the work and um, continue to raise um, their achievement levels. Obviously technology is critical for all of this. It enables all of these processes to happen. Now here we see our model strategy for project-based learning that doesn't, again, doesn't have to happen at a special time and a special event, but throughout the year. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, um, but basically we go through five steps. So the first step is propose. So the teacher and the students um, work on a proposal, as we would in a work process at work, um, to create a project plan. So we've proposed a project that will help students um, uh, learn the standards and the content that's required, but also will Im involve um, doing research and, and creating some kind of product. Uh, as, as students become more sophisticated, they can work on the project proposal um, more heavily than in the earlier grades. The second step is to plan. So the teacher and the students focus on areas to personalize uh, around the project, the work process that is being used. Um, again, as the more students are more capable, the more they can do their own plans. Excellent teachers like the one we will see today uh, and talk to today will actually have a project planning process and templates, just like we would at a work um, uh, work project um, in our workplace so that the students can follow a select plan and also um, achieve milestones. Uh, third is the persist stage and that's the hardest part that's where the project is actually being done and the students will run into obstacles because this kind of work is much more open-ended than the normal kind of textbook or worksheet work they do in class and so that they're going to do a, a draft or a prototype of the project uh, product they'll solicit feedback from the teacher as I said they'll run into obstacles they'll find strategies for uh, for uh, overcoming the obstacles um, they'll revise add ideas it's a very in iterative process and again we'll hear from our students about how they persisted in their project in spite of obstacles. Next is produce and this is where project-based learning often ends. A final product is developed and um, it is presented sometimes to the class and it's checked against a rubric and it's very important to do the product and have it be meaningful. That's the reason the first three steps were completed by the student but to make it more powerful we go to step five which is publish. Now this is the final step which is 
really related to authentic learning, authentic audience. This is where the product can be presented to parents, community, other teachers, or even on the Internet. Um, students receive feedback and feel great pride in their accomplishments. And we've seen many schools that produce wonderful products. They actually become products on the Internet or products for their community um, that will be around for a long time, not just because they did them for school. So that's the P3 project process model. And so in summary, the P3 pedagogical strategy for project-based learning includes the major characteristics I mentioned earlier based on research and education as well as uh, what's been studied by writers such as Don Tapscott. I mentioned 3.0 at the beginning of this presentation. It's a holistic new way of thinking about education. We have to transform our pedagogy, and these are the keys to success. First, personalized learning for meeting every student's interests and needs. Challenging but realistic expectations, interdisciplinary to start, start to bring the core subjects back together, authentic and relevant to the students as well as society, engaging and collaborative so that the students can really feel meaningful work is being done in their school, and then product-based focus, which is going to be something that I think people need to focus on more in the, in the future. And this will help students acquire 21st century skills as well as the core and specialized knowledge and finally, a physical product and performance that will reflect their capabilities. Now let's go to a short commercial break, and then we'll be discussing this project-based process with some students and their teacher. Welcome aboard Flight 1120. Please be sure your luggage is stowed. Your seat backs and tray tables are in their full upright and locked position. There are six exits on this plane. Four doors, two exits on each side. And two window exits over the wing. To fasten your seat belt, insert the flat middle end into the buckle until it's locked securely. To tighten, pull the strap. Your mobile phones and other electronic devices should now be blah, 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 blah. If necessary, oxygen masks will drop from above your seat. Remember, secure your own mask before helping others. A water evacuation. Unlikely. But just in case, your seat cushion could be used as a flotation device. Please take a moment to locate the exit nearest you. Last year, 320 million hours were lost to airport delays, not to mention all the time spent flying. You can also inflate the vest by blowing into the tube. Introducing the end of lost time and the beginning of productivity. Cisco Telepresence. Meet more, travel less. That's the human network effect. Cisco, welcome to the human network. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our guests who are implementing project-based learning in their classroom on a daily basis. First, let me welcome Lissa Hughes, Hi, a fifth grade teacher at McEntee Academy in Alum Rock School District in San Jose, California. Welcome, Lissa. Welcome. Or thank you for having me. Uh, we'll also have with us three of her students, Raynor Takalog. Hi. Hi. Marcus Nanola. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And Charles Lasich. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Welcome, all three of you. I'm hoping to get some more information about how you did project-based learning in your classroom. But first, I'm going to start asking questions of your teacher. So, Ms. Hughes, can you please share with, with us why you did project-based learning and um, how you planned the projects for your classroom? Well, I do project-based learning because it allows for different learning styles to excel in the classroom. Not everyone thinks the same way. Not everyone works at the same rate. And it allows them to work at their own speed and be proud of what they produce, no matter what their abilities are. And I start by coming with what I want as my common goal at the end. What do I want them to produce at the end? And I wanted them to be able to produce great writing pieces and be able to research better than they have been throughout the year. And also get on the computer and start typing some things. And so from there, I started formulating a plan. And what was the project that they're going to talk about today? They had to make a school newspaper, and it consisted of many, many different sections. They had a city section, a school section, a classroom section, a sports section, entertainment, just like a regular newspaper would have. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> And how did you build in the standards that you were trying to achieve as well? Because this is a content and skill project. It's not just for right. fun. Um, well, 
allowing them to work on the computers and have laptops throughout the entire day, they were able to start their projects, they would type everything, and then they can email it to me, and then we can sit there in class and we can fix their grammar mistakes. So they're learning better grammar skills as we go along. Mm -hmm. And as that last paper starts coming in, I'm not making as many corrections with them. Um, but I also get to see them formulate five paragraph essays, whereas before they might have only been able to start with like two or three. So these are the writing standards that they right. should be able to achieve by the end of fifth grade? Right. Okay, great. Um, so how did you um, get the students to be independent and persistent? Because I assume that they were used to more structured work before. Right. Um, my class is a very independent class as it is. They do a lot of group work. We've done project-based learning before. And giving them the freedom to do it on their own and choose their own topics gave them um, just their own mind to say, I can do this because it's something I'm interested in mm -hmm. versus I'm not interested in this. I could care less about this project. That happens in school sometimes? Yeah. You know, <laughs> okay. okay. And then what outcomes did you see in them? So what learning outcomes, skill outcomes, maybe social outcomes as a result of this project? Well, especially in these three students, I saw Raynor really take off as like a journalist. Um, he really loved writing about sports, like really started taking it like the sports broadcasting. And from that, I decided to take a few, away a few of the other articles and let him go deeper into the sports part because he was doing so well with that. I was like, well, why not just mm -hmm. keep going with that? And I made modifications to other projects along the way. Based on what they were doing well with. Charles um, didn't really like writing all that much before and realized that he could start writing at the end and was pr pr producing great pieces. He wrote about a total, I mean, a fake basketball game, but it was absolutely amazing the way he wrote it. It was like a, he was at the game. Wow. It's so, amazing. Yeah. And uh, Marcus? Marcus is an overall great writer, but it really, um, I like that it really honed in on his researching skills because mm -hmm. he can write great pieces and he's very precise, but it really allowed him to start broadening his resources right. and get into the internet. So it's very personalized for all right. the students and you did this for all of the students in your class. Right. Fantastic. Okay. Now we're going to ask the students some questions. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to ask you about the topics that you chose and uh, what you learned. So I'm going to start with Raynor. What, where did you, it sounds like you, you kind of zoomed in on the sports, but what specifically did you learn about and write uh, about? I learned out how to write uh, better because sports is like my favorite thing. So I just so I told Miss Seuss about an idea and she, and she started to like it. And then she gave me, she just, she gave me more sports to write and gave me less other things to write. Mm -hmm. What specific sports did you write about? Um, about basketball. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's all. Okay. Marcus? Uh, I think, like, that this project helped me be more organized because I was always an organized person. But now I could keep track of, like, time, like, due dates, mm -hmm. when to turn it in. And that really helped me, and that's still going to help me. Okay. And what was your topic of most interest? Sports was Which the most Which interesting sports? one. Uh, I mainly did it mostly on basketball. Mm -hmm. Because that's my favorite sport. Now, didn't you find a famous basketball player from California that, as your key person from California article? Oh, yeah, Jason Kidd. Yeah. And why is he important? He's important because in the Bay Area, we don't have many great, like, superstars in sports. And, you know, he's still playing in, in basketball, and he's a good player, and a lot of kids look up to him as a player and a person. Great. And Charles? You wrote about a basketball game. Yeah. How did you make up a basketball game? Um, I took two of my good friends, Raynor and Jeffrey, and and I named the basketball game the Shorties because they're <laughs> short. And short. Um, and I would like, like, because I seen how they both played, and they played pretty good, and I would know, like, if, like, if they shoot, they probably won't make it, or they probably will. So, so you wrote all of that yeah. in the story? Yeah. As if it was a real report on a real basketball game. Yeah. That's fantastic. Okay. Now let me ask you some questions about the, the type of work that you, that you did. Um, how did you stay organized, Charles? Because I heard you might not have been so organized before yeah, this project. Yeah, I lost two of my things, and I, didn't, and, I, and I couldn't find them at home, and I couldn't find them on the two computers at school. And so I couldn't really put it on there, so I had to try to, like, I tried to remember it, but mm -hmm. then I couldn't really. And then I asked Miss Hughes for a folder, and she gave me one, and then I, I got organized. Great. Is that more organized than you've ever been before? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, what about obstacles, Marcus? What obstacles did you face? Well, I. And how did you get over those obstacles? I had a interview with a nice teacher named Miss Barring at her school, and so I already finished typing it, and it was time to go. And I put it in my desk, or at least I thought I did, and then the <laughs> next day I couldn't find it, so I guess I misplaced it. I was looking around, but instead of just wasting my time, I just decided I'm not going to find it. Might as well just retype it. Mm -hmm. And that really helped me, but now I have to stay organized so I won't have to do it twice. Right. Now, you had a similar, Raynor, you had a similar challenge oh, with yeah. a teacher. Can you talk about that and yeah, how you overcame that? Yeah, because I... Um, I I interviewed a teacher named Miss Gardner, and I was kind of nervous because I thought she would say no to me. So, but then I decided I needed that for my grade, so I decided to ask her, and she said yeah, and I got like uh, a ten out of it, ten out of ten out of it. Wow! And so, what you overcame your fear of being having to interview someone and uh, and someone that was maybe kind of a stranger to you. So next time you inter did you interview anybody else after that? Uh. No? But no. when you do, you'll probably be more comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So you're proud of yourself for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so what do you like about project-based learning? What are some key things that are different about this learning than the normal work you might do other times at school? Marcus? Uh, I think the best parts are that it makes it more fun, and we're still learning at the same time while we are having fun. And... I think it helped us learn a little bit more because doing work, worksheets is pretty boring and <laughs> you get distracted, you don't finish your work, mm -hmm. you won't get to go to recess. And I think project-based learning helped us learn. Okay. Raynor? Well, I like about project-based learning is that it gave me an, another choice of being a journalist because... If I don't fulfill my sports dream, I could become a journalist instead. Which is? Which is? Your sports dream is? Uh, being a basketball player. All right. And, and this project will really help you a lot. So you're, now you have a career you have in mind that you yeah. wouldn't have before as an alternative. Great. And you talked about choice for your life, sounds like. Yeah. Okay. And Charles, how about you? Freedom? Freedom? I really liked it and I really didn't because I kind of got carried away. Uh. <laughs> and, yeah. So it was hard to stay yeah. on track? So you... I would like go, like one time I remember I took my chair and I sat next to Miss Hughes and so I wouldn't get distracted. Oh, okay. So there was freedom, but... Yeah. Okay. Now you all said about your friends you collaborated. Um, tell me how you worked with your peers on, your friends on the the, paper, the work. Did they look at your work and give you feedback or who wants to talk about that? Marcus? Uh, I think it was helpful because almost all the boys in my class, all of our friends are interested in sports, so they could give us stuff about our person we're doing it on that we didn't know, and that really helped us. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? They gave us more information about, like, um, if you want to do a player and you didn't really know, it, and, like, these two right here, Reno and Marcus, they really know a lot about basketball, so I didn't really know. So I would ask them, and they would give That's me great. a lot of information on them. And, Reno, did they? Did you have people looking at your paperwork to see if you'd written well? Did they correct your writing or anything like that? Did you? Uh, have yeah, only one person mm -hmm. um, named... Oh. Delma was looking at your yeah. work a lot. Yeah, Delma, yeah, because um, she was, like, my neighbor, uh -huh. and I helped her, so we were kind of like partners. Yeah. Which is really helped me. Great. So there was a lot of collaboration. I heard earlier, too, that you got to sit next to your friends for this kind of work and not necessarily the people that Miss Hughes had assigned you. Right. So, Miss Hughes, um, how was your class different after this project than they were before? Um, I saw them actually start to enjoy things in class because, I mean, there's so much monotonous to the day that you do have to go through. And I saw them actually take hold of their learning. They took hold of what they wanted. They wanted to be doing it. Mm -hmm. It was something they came in every day. And if I wasn't saying we're going to start our newspapers right away, mm -hmm. they actually got upset about it. And, you know, they're like, why not? And I was right. like, well, we have something else going on. And they got, you know, to hear them upset because they can't do a project is a, kind of a cool thing. And, and one of the things I think to cap this up off, one of the things you told me was that another teacher came in the room once 
and the students are all doing their project-based learning. Very, very busy. Right. Now, remember I talked about knowledge workers before, right? So yes. it was like a workplace. And she came in and she was amazed that they weren't all sitting in their desks and listening to you talk. And right. They, she said it was very busy. It was a nice little chatter. Yeah, and she was, I mean, she came in, and she was coming in to observe students for next year and whatnot, and she comes in, and she says, wow, they're all working. <laughs> and they, I had, my students are sitting on the ground working, they sit in their desk, they sit at tables, it's where they're, they feel most comfortable working, uh -huh. like they say, they thought they're friends. Right. But they also know, like Charles, when he gets a little too distracted, he needs to remove himself, right. so. Great, excellent. Well, I hope that the audience can see that you have done the things that I recommend, Cisco recommends, um, and I really appreciate all of you coming here and for you all three to take a time away from your summer vacation to come to Cisco to do this for us. I appreciate it. And I hope that you all do really well in middle school next year, too. Um, it sounds as though project-based learning is really taking off at McEntee and it is, Academy, yes. and I think you'll probably have a great next year as well. Yeah. And I hope you all can apply this when you go to middle school as well. Thanks. Okay, now I'd like to take a few minutes to answer questions from the audience. So please type in your question in the lower right portion of your screen if you have any questions. So let's see what we have. Okay, first of all, the first question is, how does project-based learning approach uh, work in practice in high schools? And I wanted to mention um, the school High Tech High. Many people have heard about High Tech High in San Diego. It's actually eight schools now that are K through 12 that use project-based learning. But it's not that they do a lot of projects every day. It's really that they do process-based learning um, where the students are always working on a project that produces some kind of a product, an artwork, a movie, um, uh, a field guide for the, for the Bay. Everything is done um, very meaningfully for those students. Um, and they're very successful. They have 100% of their students graduating from high school and going on to college or secondary school. So it does work in the high school. Again, it takes a lot of um, careful planning. I'm going to ask um, Lisa about that in a second because we have another question about that. Um, so I will ask that question now. What are the practical challenges of preparing the curriculum and your lesson plans and all that to do project-based learning. What are schools going to face if they want to implement this approach? Um, the biggest uh, like obstacle I have um, is facing the standards and the curriculum that we do have to face, um, especially the language arts programs and the math programs. Um, project-based learning is a lot easier to implement with science and social studies. So it takes a little bit more work and a little bit more structure to be able to start taking the language arts that you do, are supposed to implement and start pulling it with the science and the social studies and math and integrating it mm -hmm. all instead of it just doing it in block by block mm -hmm. by block, mm -hmm. showing how they all relate together. Right. And so. do you, you collaborate with other teachers to do this uh, preparation work? Will you be doing that next year? Yes. We, um, as, and on my fifth grade team, we work a lot together on creating um, project-based, you know, learning in classrooms and different classrooms take a different approach on it, but for the most part, we're all doing the same project. Right. Okay, great. So I have a question for the students here. So sounds like project-based learning is fun, but is it just fun? Or are you, do you really feel like it is schoolwork and, and why do you, would you feel that way? Because Charles? it feels like schoolwork and fun. Because schoolwork is like, um, you get to like, do some papers, read the right, and for like just fun, you get to research, and, and So tell me about the research. How hard was it to decide what you were going to write about when you did research? Because you did look a lot of things probably on the internet. Yeah, I would just go to Google. What? Google? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I would just type up what I need to research, and it would give me some information. I'll click on it, and then I would ask my teacher if I could print it, and I'll print it, and that's what would be my information. Okay. Marcus, what about you? Is this just fun, something to do at the end of school after the tests have been done? Or it's is it fun, real school work? It's challenging. It's all sorts of things. But I think it was most mostly challenging because it was fun, but it was challenging because... We had to keep our papers in order. We had to get it by June 8th, that certain time, and that made it challenging because we usually turn in stuff late, and this time the shoes didn't accept it late. Okay. Raynor, anything to add on that? Well, I think it was fun and uh, fun and educational because because while we're, while we're doing research, we can listen to music, which was hmm. kind of enjoying. But that's not all. Um, 
I also learned that uh, what you once you go to research real deep, you could uh, you can make a really good story. Great, great. And you talked about juicy writing when you yeah. wanted to make something juicy. Yeah. Yeah. What, that, what does that mean? <laughs> that you want something interesting that that others that want to read it. That makes others want to read it. Okay, so you thought about your audience. Yeah. Okay, and that was something we talked about earlier about the uh, what we call an authentic audience. So very, very good, very good help. Um, there, there is a question here on what evidence do we have that this type of pedagogy prepares uh, students adequately for college and the workforce. And the studies that I mentioned earlier in the presentation um, definitely uh, reflect on the success of project-based learning when it's been done. And project-based learning is not new. It's been around um, predict really for over 30 years. And uh, it's just a matter of why, how we have to transform the um, whole structure of a school system to address the needs of the students as customers. Do you think of yourselves as customers of your school? That you're the one that the school has to deliver good teachers to? Because yeah. you're the customer? Like when you go to the store and you're a customer? Do you think of yourself that way? I do. I would think that way too. Good. Yeah. Not a factory. You're not working in a factory and you're yeah. a factory worker. Okay. No. Great, great. So it looks like you have a teacher who believes that students are the customers. So that's really good. Um, so there's a lot of research. And I think we heard it today with a couple of the students talking about um, their career. So you've identified that you could be a sports journalist. And now yeah. from now on, you could actually be learning about that and looking at that. Um, so it's, it's really exciting. Uh, again, we have to transform the entire um, school district's policies and procedures and curriculum development. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. And we've seen it here in an individual classroom as well as the rest of your school, I think, has quite a bit that's going on. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, audience, for your questions. And I, I'd finally like to say that we at Cisco certainly do believe it's possible to get set an agenda for change. Um, without your help, we can't do it. We need input from education leaders around the world and input from people like you are actually doing it. And uh, that's why we've set up a public service website called getideas.org. And it's a place for education leaders to collaborate on a new vision for change. So I urge you to visit Get Ideas, connect with other leaders, join the dialogue on global education transformation. Also, the new Get Ideas site will be launched next weekend, and it features an extensive section on Education 3.0, where you can learn more about this new thinking and share your thoughts. Please don't forget to check out our other recent broadcasts on our ser in our series on the Get Ideas website. We value your input and look forward to seeing you on Get Ideas, and thank you again for joining us today. Goodbye. Bye.